but started really trading in the 80s when I read your first Market Wizards uh, book, and a lot of people here have. I just want to go through some facts. Um, the a, first book was published in 1989. Uh, that's right. And um, Jack worked for re uh, research as an analyst at Commodities Corp. And the person he replaced, who must love you dearly, Michael Marcus, he turned, I don't know, how much money? Uh, Michael, well, um, when he was at Commodities Corp, he, they gave him a $30,000 account. And uh, in about a dozen years, it was worth $80 million. And uh, I worked at Commodities Corp, so I know it's true. And so, uh, uh, a cra a oh, and that is with taking out 20% expenses every year. So, and, and so, so Jack has flown around the world interviewing traders. And, and just to let you know, fifty thousand dollars invested in Uber is worth eighty million. So you know he's not that impressive. <laughs> uh, and they didn't have to trade a stock. The uh, but so Jack, you started. You had a big idea. You wanted to invent or, or create something that would last a lifetime for for readers. What was the epiphany that said, "I got to do with the, mar the market, market wizards"? wizards? Yeah. Uh, I had the idea for actually years before I did the book. Um, so people don't know, but I actually, the first book I wrote was not Market Wizard, it was an analytical book called The Complete Guide to the Futures Markets. And I got approached uh, a few years later about some, some publisher wanted me to do a whole bunch of these books, um, you know, analytical books. And I said, I've, I've done it, you know, I took a sabbatical to do that, I didn't want to do that again. I said, I want to do more of a wide audience thing. And I said, I've had this idea, and I, that was the Market Wizard idea. I said, and I said, well, we'll do it. And so. So that's, that, that was a catalyst, but I had the idea for years. I just thought I knew some of these people, like Michael Marcus and, and Bruce Kovner, uh, that were not known basically to the world, they were just great traders, and I thought it'd be an interesting thing to, to interview them and, other, and, and find other you know, traders, known and unknown. And, and it'd be, um, I thought it wasn't so much, my motivation was not to write the book, really. It was really, I said, hey, that's a real good excuse to meet these people and pick their brains, and uh, it was more like a fun project. Um, and it turned out the writing of it was, was actually uh, the, more the big deal, but uh, that was a genesis. Well, thank you. Because I've read them all. Now, remin so how did reminiscences of a stock operator play into that? Well, reminiscences... Just, uh, if you're not familiar with the book, a quick yeah, description uh, would be yeah. a, a ficti not a fictitious person, but go ahead. Oh, yeah. So reminiscences of it back when uh, my early days, um, there was one great, one great trading book, um, and uh, it was called Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. Probably a lot of you have, have if not read it, at least heard of it. Uh, and it was a book written by, by Edwin Lefebvre, who was a uh, journalist. And back one day when I read it, people, it's about, it's a, it's, it's a, a book about Jesse Livermore. The protagonist, the one who's giving this narrative, uh, is Jesse Livermore. And the thing is written so well that when I was reading it back in those days, people thought Le Lefebvre was the pseudonym for Jesse Livermore. But he was actually a real journalist and he was not a traitor, but he wrote it so well that people thought it was written by Livermore himself. Um, and the book is just filled with these great insights, which are still, the book is now 100 years old, literally close to 100 years old. And it, it's still as relevant. And uh, I say this and it sounds immodest, but it's true. When I, when I was writing Market Wizards, I didn't want, I used a different format, different style. But I said, hey, I'm reading this book 65 years after it's written. It's still totally pertinent. So I really believe that the truths in the market um, don't really change. So the basic things still are applicable and stay true because they relate to human nature. And human, it's, what doesn't change is really human nature. And, be, and because of that, certain things that were true 100 years ago is still true and will be true 100 years from now. So um, I, I said I wanted to write a book that, hey, if I'm successful at 75 years from now, somebody's reading this will still, still be relevant. And, and so that was my model. That, that, that's the relevance of it. And, and I think the best quote that I have, um, because I, I, I'm both, is uh, you say amateurs go broke taking large losses, uh, professionals go broke taking small profits. Small profits, yeah. So let's walk through that because I've done both. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let's. And I read your book. So do you owe me money? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I take no obligation. I've got to. <laughs> Uh, so on both of those, first of all, the, the quote is by Bill Eckhart. Bill Eckhart, uh, most people wouldn't know Bill Eckhart at all, it wasn't for the book. But Bill Eckhart, it was Richard Dennis's partner. And if you know the famous uh, story of the turtles and the bet they had whether traders could be trained or not, um, 
and and Dennis was saying that they, you know, uh, I forget who had which side of the bet, but that was their basic bet. And 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 to 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 to, um, to solve the to see who was right, they put an ad in the Wall Street Journal, and they they picked like these, uh, and they got thousands of responses with trained traders, and they picked not traders, but they picked people like chess players and gam uh, and blackjack players. They were looking for say, you know, or, or people, they weren't looking for traders per se. Um, and they did this experiment. So Bill Eckhart was one of the ones who trained the group. Eckhart was a, uh, he didn't actually, I think he dropped out. He never wrote his thesis in mathematics, so I don't think he has officially a PhD, but he was in a PhD math program. So he's a mathematician by background, and he's a CTA that's been around for a long time. So that was his quote, and his, his interview has a lot of really good quotes. So, so to the heart of it, um, so uh, amateurs go broke taking large losses. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, that is, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a cliche, yeah, but why? things are cliches because they're true. And it, it's the, the, the biggest mistake made by the most people, I mean, it fills both categories, it kills the most traders, and it is the biggest mistake, is taking large losses. And even traders who have experience fall into that trap. I know I fall into that trap, you know, way after I should have fallen into that trap. And it, 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 I think when you're, uh, to go off on a slight tangent, when you have trading experience, when you fall for that trap, if it's like myself speaking personally, but I'm sure most people who here fall into that trap after you have experience, it's usually because you've done really well. So to go off on a tangent, another thing I would throw in is when things are going really well, watch out, because that's when you're most likely to lose your, your, your discipline and, and get a little cavalier. Um, but so, so, so the large losses is really, I think, the, the, this, in fact, so I say if I was stuck, if I had to give advice to traders, if somebody said to, you, said to me, Jack, you you got to give advice to these to this group of traders, the uh, room of traders, and uh, but there's a catch. You can only use ten words. Okay, if I could only use ten words, what ten words would I use? And it would be a quote by Bruce Kovner, uh, which um, which is know where you're going to get out before you get in, and that rule will keep you from you know from that mistake of losing a lot of money um, on on one trade, which is the the mistake that the uh, uh, amateurs make. The professionals. The other side of that coin, and that speaks to uh, patience, is that people, human nature is to try to grab a profit. You know, you've got money, you know, well, if you take it now, you can feel good about it. And so it's very difficult to hold on to things that you need to hold on to. And so what, what Eckhart is saying is, if you've got an approach, and if, when you're right, if you don't get at least a reasonable amount of profit out of that trade when you're right, you're just not going to have enough to cover your losses. Because you're going to lose a certain percentage at a time, so you have to make your winners at least realize some reasonable percentage of their potential, and that's that's the thing that that amateur that professionals go broke because they're just grabbing profits too quickly, the profits are too small, and then they're just not making enough to cover the losses. From personal experience, that is the one. I also say don't let uh, trades become investments, but it's okay to let an investment become a trade. That's kind of, I don't know who said it, but I'm claiming uh -huh. it. Yeah. Uh, but I, it's something I live by. Every time I, 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 I let a trade and start justifying it later, I got to get rid of it. Yeah. And, and vice versa. But I think that's really the key information that, that you're saying there. And, and for me, it was discovering angel investing because that forced me to stay in. You know, if I believe in a trend and a team, uh, angel investing cured my short-term profit-taking uh, disease, which is a big, for prof or semi-professionals, what we're going to call ourselves, is, is an issue. The, let's talk quickly about methodology, not being the secret. Right. When you hear that, what, like, what is the secret? It's not methodology. Yeah, so I, I tell people, it's not the method. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not that there's, I mean, amateur, I mean, particularly people getting into trading early on, there's always a search for for what's the great what's the right entry approach and and, and reading all these books and tr sometimes buying trading systems and and trying to find you know, hey the market there is no one approach that works and if there's one approach that worked it would go away because too many people would use it and it would no longer work and that's happened by the way that happens in the hedge fund industry all the time somebody comes up with an idea a new way of uh, trading a new idea a new arbitrage whatever and it gets on and it goes away and it, and it happens continuously so so it's not about a particular method. Um, or some secret in the markets. There is no secret. But what is critical, and, and this goes to the heart of what your question is, is not finding sort of the, the secret about the markets, the method, but there, but there is a method that's right for you. So, and that's going to be different for everybody. So uh, it's not about finding the method that's right for everybody. It's the, finding the method that's right for you. 
And for some people, it could be, let's say, purely fundamental. For some people, it could be purely technical. For some, it could be a mixture of the both. It could be short term, it could be long term, it could be trading stocks, it could be trading futures, it could be trading both. I mean, you can make a million variations, but there's going to be something that fits right. It's sort of like uh, I get, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had emails or call, or, or even in the audiences, somebody asks me, well, well what, what approach should I use? You know? And I, you know, especially I get like an email, you know, what do you recommend? What, I, uh, what, what should I use? And it's sort of like somebody sending me an email and saying, I'm going out to buy a suit who I never met. I'm going out to buy a suit. What size should I get? What do I know? You know, I don't know if you're 6'6 six, six or 5'6. I mean, that's a stupid question. So there is no single answer. But given your personality, given what you believe in, given what feels right, things are going to be. And I'll give you an example. Let me throw out an example. Uh, Jim Rogers, who you probably, most of you probably know, because he's guy, guy who was, uh, started out with George Soros and then left George Soros because he wanted to be on, he didn't want to be part of a big firm. And, and he's done very well as a private investor. When you can read his interview in. Um, but that's a big name you never got. Oh, no. I, he, oh, you Rogers, got Soros? yeah. Rogers in the, is in the. Oh, no. First, Soros you didn't get. No, Soros, Soros I didn't get, yeah. So, yeah, and Soros I couldn't get through. I couldn't get him to agree. I mean, not, I never spoke to Soros. Well, directly. you're not Jewish. <laughs> What's you that? You should have had a Jew organizer. No, 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 I am. Oh, yeah. So there you go. Yeah, well, there you go. go. Secret happening. handshake. Secret. There handshake. you go. There you secret go. Handshake. <laughs> didn't work. Secret, didn't work. Didn't work. <laughs> uh, it's like Goldman Sachs, but for not Goldman. No, Sachs. so that didn't. Work, that, that had nothing to do with it apparently. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, well, so we were uh, talking about um, uh, Rogers. Jim Rogers. Rogers. Yeah, Rogers. So we're just talking about the, 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 the different. I want to give you just an idea how contrasting the, 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 these these uh, opinions are. Um, so Rogers, uh, and if you read his interview, he, all his predict when I was interviewing him back, and this book came out in 89, 80, he's talking about gold at the time, that, you know, he's predicting, well, gold's going to be down for another 10 years, and it did, you know, and he talked about the Nikkei at the time was uh, like 34,000 or something like that, he talked about it going down at 10, when it was still going up, you know, and it, it topped not that long after. So uh, those are pretty bold predict predictions, and he was, he's very good in the long-term fundamentals. Uh, so that's that's Rogers, and uh, his his attitude. I asked him, well, you know, I know you're a fundamentalist, you know, you're fundamentals, but you ever look at charts? And then he says, you know, like he's admitting a uh, like a sin. Like I asked him if he ever looks at penthouse under the desk or something. I don't know. Uh, does he? And he does. I, yeah, I didn't ask him that. <laughs> so he says, well, you know, if you mean, do I ever look at it just to see where the price has been or just get an idea? Yeah, but do I believe in any of this? Head and shoulders, mumbo jumbo. It's all a bunch of, you know, it's all a bunch of garbage. And I said, I, I said, I never met a rich technician. And then he pauses and just to be cute and he says, unless you count those that sell their services. So I don't know how much more cynical you can get about technical analysis. And then you have somebody like Marty Schwartz. And Marty, uh, for those who haven't read the book or you read it and forgot, Schwartz, when I actually he was going to manage money for Commodities Corp at the time, he had his his, money, his uh, track record was audited. He was very proud. And he showed me this track record, which was basically he'd been entering these contests every uh, and, and uh, turning like 400,000 into over a million every four months. And he had this 10-year track record, and it was a 25% average return. Uh, you guys not, not impressed, right? 25% per month average return. Okay. And, and if, he, if those, those quants in the room, if you're compounding, the reason he didn't own a quarter of the GMP is because his father went through the Depression and... Uh, he was very uh, concerned about things going, he instilled in the son of this concern about things going wrong. So Schwartz would like, like make, you know, take 400, turn it into over a million, put the bunny in T-bills and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. So he was making 25% a month uh, uh, over that 10 year period roughly and, uh, and he was just keep, kept on banking it in T-bills. So uh, Schwartz, on, on, to give you the opposite side uh, of Rogers, uh, Schwartz used to be a stock analyst. He lost money all the time and he said, you know, I was a stock analyst, I lost money all the time, and I became a tech, and I got richer as a technician. And then he was like paraphrasing people, uh, you know, people like Roger saying that, you know, what a nonsensical attitude people have, you know, like technical analysis is not, uh, you know, it's nonsense. So you got completely opposite views. So that should tell you that there is no secret approach. But, you know, Schwartz would go broke trading fundamentals, and he did lose the trying fundamentals, and Rogers, who's cynical about technical analysis, even if he tried to use it, it wouldn't work. So it's really about the right approach for you. So I want to just now switch with Emmanuel, your partner, to the future. Because um, the future is what matters to me. You know, uh, I say it all the time. It's like, read Market Wizards. Uh, engulf yourself in these stories because they're real. And that's been written. He's done an amazing job. And it's, it, you can find it anywhere. But let's talk about, how old are you now? 
I'm 66. So, so in the short period of time Jack has left on Earth, let's hey, talk about. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I'm a healthy 66. Biotech. Yeah. You know, I saw someone say this to it was it uh, Virgin Richard Branson. Someone said this to Rich. Biotech can't save you, but I, it's going to save me. Um, so, so let's talk about the future. You're 66. I think we've all, like, I think people don't understand this. I'm trying to come to grasp this. This is like, we're on the cusp of maybe living longer. I mean, we're living longer, but you, you and I, like, I'm in yeah. my 50. And uh, all I can think about is, you know, man, could I, if I could have 30 more good years. <laughs> Not just live to 80, but like, they're good years. So what's technology, like, what does the, the wizard of the future, do you think, uh, look like with you know this, we live now so global and we have so much technology. What are the things that you think will make standouts? I mean the the systems may and the methodologies and the money management matters, but can they come out of any? Like what do you think is going to happen? Oh, gee, um, uh, I, I that's I I don't think it, it's a matter of like the, the, there was a, so you may get some cases it might be more of a tech and quantity. You get that now you. We're, 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 uh, with big data, you have people exploiting data in ways, but that'll go, that, that gets arbitraged away because then you get other people doing the same thing. Um, and, and even today, successful traders don't, aren't, necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily people who are doing this you know, stuff that depends on technology. It, it, could, it just, in some cases, just doing the right thing and just having the innate talent and they're just single, single people trading on their own and it's not... Uh, I don't. I don't think it has to do so much with with the technology trend. It, it creates different approaches, but but in some way, I think the great traders are still are, are still going to be the same as they were. They they'll have the, the right the right personality and and psychological traits to be successful. Do you believe it's born or is it learned? Both. Uh, I think I think somebody like Marcus. Um, I'll use Marcus as an example. He had like an innate talent to just. I remember. Well, he, he left his analyst slot, and this was actually not a commodity scope. We both ended up in commodity scope, but, but um, he left his analyst slot, and I took it over. It was a Wall Street uh, brokerage firm, uh, but we, he was still he was going to be a trader, and he was still in New York for for a bit. And so we used to get together for lunches. And I remember I was an an I was I remember I come from an economics background, and and uh, at the time I was a fundamental analyst on different futures markets, and one of the markets I had was cotton, and I did this like. Uh, I did a study of every cotton market in the post-World War II period and supply and demand, and, and I came to the conclusion there were only about three, three, three years in which there was true free, uh, free markets because in most of the years the government loan programs would, would actually distort the price. And so um, based on those three markets I came to the conclusion, which was, which was not a good thing because it's not enough data really. But anyway, the conclusion I came was that, that we were going to have a bull market that year and, and the markets were going to go, the previous side had been about 35, and I said that's where we're going to go probably around 35, and we were 25. Um, and, and that was right, by the way, as far as it went. However, I, when it got to the mid-30s, I thought it was going to be all over. And Marcus, you know, and I remember having, I said, nah, it's going to go much higher. And, and, uh, and by the way, cotton that year went not only much higher, it went, it went from 35 to like almost a dollar. It almost tripled from where its previous high, which is enormous, and that was the highest price it had ever seen in the 20th century by a long shot. I mean, more than triple the previous high. Now, the reason Marcus was able to do this, and this goes to the distinction between, you know, what makes a really born or, or, or can you learn it? There was like a hundred facts. I did all this analysis, and I came up with a conclusion which had some value, but really was way off in, in its ultimate result. But but Marcus understood that there was only one fact that mattered: China, uh, the PRC at the time. Was, was entering as a buyer into the cotton market for the first time. And he understood that one fact trumped everything. That's all that made a difference. So he saw that this big trend was because China was in the market. It was going to be totally right, 100% right. But out of 100 facts, he knew which fact to pick. See, that's, 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 that's the, the, net, the born part of it. Now, can you, can you become a better trader uh, through experience? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think innately I'm a horrible trader and I would always lose money and it's only because I know something that I'm net profitable, but I'm still not a great trader. Uh, I think so, I, I think you can, um, you can become better, uh, you can become profitable, but, but to be great, I think, part, that's like anything else. Uh, I, uh, if, you're, if you're a runner, no matter how hard you train, uh, unless you're born with the right body type, you'll never, you'll, you'll ne let's say, let me use a male running time here, so just keep it You'll never run like under a 210. Uh, no matter, you can train forever, you can be the most dedicated person in the world. Your body will, very few people have the body that can, 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 can run that, uh, that speed. 
but you can become, you can run a marathon at a reasonable pace if you, if you, if you train hard. So that's the difference between born and, 